Hey y'all, I'm Kelly Moody and you're listening to the Ground Shots Podcast, an audio project exploring our relationship to ecology through conversations and storytelling with farmers, herbalists, craftspeople, naturalists, artists, and more. This uh, episode is with Samuel, um, a... Zapotec weaver from Oaxaca that I actually met uh, on the way to Buc- the Buckeye Gathering, which is an ancestral skills gathering that happens every year outside of Concal, California, on uh, the Sierra foothills, sort of near Chico, the bigger city that people might recognize. And just I was working for the gathering as an assistant for one of the people running it, and they messaged me sort of a couple days before the gathering saying that there was someone in Nevada City that needed a ride and that's where I have been um, living some. And I picked him up the couple days before the gathering started because I needed to get there early to do work uh, for the gathering. And um, (laughs) the first sight of Samuel... um, reading a book in the local brewery and all of his luggage uh he just immediately seemed very joyful and fun and uh we just started talking about uh, weaving and plants and culture and just so many different things and so we just kind of became friends right away and uh I asked him if I could interview him and he thought that sounded great so as you'll hear Samuel um, comes from a weaving tradition. I think he said maybe there his people have been in this area for maybe over 14,000 years. Really cool to talk to someone who has that uh, connection, deep connection with the land and and with a craft that is a part of that connection. We did this interview at dusk kind of as it was getting dark on a log, trying to be away from like all the hubbub of the gathering, but there were lots of nature sounds happening, frogs and some geese flying over and um, people walking by sometimes. So you might hear sounds of the land a little bit intermingled. Anyway, some of the things we talked about during the interview were like the power of weaving and we talk about yeah the effects of tourism and globalization on um, traditional culture in the place where Samuel's from, and we also talk about cultural appropriation and its complexity and craft and Samuel's experiences with that and Oaxacan weaving being um, exploited, um, what that looks like, and. We talked a little bit about what colonialism has looked like in Samuel's village. Uh, We talked about traditional farming and plants in Oaxaca for food and fiber. We had a big conversation on cochineo and its effect on world politics. I hope you enjoy this interview with Samuel, and um, thanks for listening. We're at the Buckeye Gathering in Concal, California, and um, yeah, it's Friday night, and everyone's really tired, (laughs) including both of us, and it's getting dark, and we're hearing 
frogs and frogs yeah and... um i'm sitting here with samuel and i gave him a ride here from nevada city and it was really awesome and i just wanted to synchronicity interview yeah <laughs> um so introduce yourself and why you're here at buckeye oh hi my name is samuel bautista lazo i am from oaxaca mexico from this weaving village called teotitlan del valle although we call it Shigia. And uh, I'm a Zapotec weaver, where uh, the Beniza or Benedista people from this region. Uh, I'm here at Bokai, um, you know, just because I was drawn to this world, to these gatherings, um, I would say through, you know, by serendipity, by meeting the right people and I've been interested in these skills and topics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just kind of uh, met really, really good people uh, along the way. And I, I've been to a previous gathering, at the Acorn Gathering, and then from then on, people spoke well about our work and uh, mm -hmm. they invited me over here to Bokai and I found the same spirit, the same faces and, you know, just a great place in nature with, mm -hmm. where we could you know share our stories or skills and live together you know for for a week and experience what kind of community we could build for ourselves and for the future and uh you've been teaching weaving all week how's that been oh it's been so much fun it's been inspiring it's been humbling and uh, just so energizing, you know, uh, having this group of people of all sorts of experiences and walks of life, you know, mm -hmm. people that have been weaving before and uh, that were still challenged with a new technique, people that were, you know, that was probably the first time weaving and uh, and also, you know, seeing their process of learning and uh, the way weaving has, some have said, changed their lives. So, this you know, week they said yeah, that? they have said that to oh. me. And I'm like, for me, this is something I take for granted. I learned how to weave since I was five, making little rags of rugs on the back frame mm -hmm. of a chair. And, uh, and having people, you know, just come to realize that uh, they could do this with their hands mm -hmm. that they could uh, create you know a little piece of art because when you weave you weave you cur create your canvas and you mm -hmm. create the image at the same time mm -hmm. so yeah it's truly you know um, inspiring and humbling to, to be part of the learning process of someone else and uh, I'm just uh, really happy to have, uh, you know, an audience that has open ears and an open heart to what I came here to share. Mm -hmm. And that's the best takeaway I'm taking from here. Cool. Is it, do you teach much in the States? Uh, no, not much, actually. Mostly at home? Yeah, I think I've only taught here at these kind of gatherings. Uh, yeah, up until like um, 10 years ago, people started to teach back in, you know, I don't know, 2015, even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was still a taboo, you know, to, to mm. kind of share or craft in this way. And uh, there's many layers to that, but um, pretty much, uh, you know, our community depends on this craft, on this mm -hmm. women's skill. Uh, and so, you know, I'm always careful to, to tell students, I'm teaching you these symbols and patterns that belong to our heritage and just please don't make commercial exploitation of this. Sure. So, you know, there's 7,000 weavers in my village. The next village has like 3,000. The next one has probably another 2,000. And so, you know, it's their bread and butter and they depend on that. So um, that's why we're being careful but um, sadly, you know, like, or uh, patterns or designs have been already 
kind of I don't know I would use the word stolen or just uh, who stole who has I mean other I th I've seen in Arizona in some uh, craft or you know those shops where tourists go to when they go to to the southwest and I've seen rugs sweet or patterns I mean and there is a clear difference between uh, our style of weaving and the traditional weavings from India but like replicas of that replicas of Navajo rugs are they being made in India yeah. when using your style yeah wow it's and sold for like I mean a tenth of the price it's funny because I worked with John all week the Hopi yeah. Tewa mm -hmm. potter and he was saying that in Arizona a bunch of their pottery yeah. is being sold that isn't made and it's being sold as yes. their pottery but yeah. it's actually being made yeah far away and to emulate but being yeah. sold locally yeah it's just crazy and but. I mean that always happens with uh, our weavings our weavings actually never really got valued for the way they are just you know just Zapotec textiles uh, in the 60s when they built the airport and the highway in our village a lot of tourists started to come mm -hmm. and so that's when the demand for rugs increased you know back in the days people were weaving blankets maybe ponchos uh, to be used uh, by the locals and to be traded you know within their means uh, people were loading up mules to take to other states like Veracruz and uh, you know take blankets and ponchos and trade it for coffee and then come back with coffee and and keep that trade but yeah when the wave of tourism uh, emerged uh, that kind of transformed our craft and uh, we started to to weave more rugs because that's what the Western oh, wow. world wanted and uh, but even then you know there were uh, we were making rugs for wholesale buyers like big import craft import companies that would come to the village and just buy a lot of weavings and bring them to the US and sell them under the Southwest team you know hmm. as Southwestern uh, yes huh. for like Southwestern style home decor um, and you know that that has kind of died out a little bit uh, but now it's just rebranded into the boho style you know now everyone wants <laughs> this kind of color palette more minimalism more so it's funny you know the way <laughs> we're actually you know in the hands of the market whatever I know I have and... seen things that look like what you're you all are making that yeah. is in style right now so yeah in the states <laughs> it's very much it's in, it's an interesting thing to think about how that happens you know and how that can be good and bad yeah you know? and i'm wondering what's gonna be next you know whatever you can call <laughs> it but for us we'll still be weavers we'll still be weaving we've been weaving for i would say pretty much ten thousand years since we were developing these ancestral skills when our ancestors started to domesticate corn um, because the earliest evidence of uh, corn domestication is in Oaxaca. Archaeologists have found uh, corn seeds that date 9,500 years before the common era. And, uh, you know, while we were developing this understanding of nature, of plants, how to use them to make, to get food, to make medicine, and to get fibers. To use them how to weave uh, we started using um, like seven types of wild cotton many different colors brown pinks agave fibers feathers and uh, they even say this type of native silk uh, mm -hmm. that belongs to this this continent wow. so yeah uh, we've been weavers since then you know and uh, it's recorded in in the books of history that um, uh, just when the Spanish arrived, our village um, was being taxed by the Aztecs, which was one of the cultures that was dominating the, that area of what we know now as Mexico. They taxed our village with um, making uh, 700 or 800 loads of clothing dyed with cochineal to be sent 
to Tenochtitlan, to what is now Mexico City, to clothe, you know, all those people oh that live there. And uh, in Cochino, it's very. It takes a long time to get a lot of that, right? Yeah, Cochineal is this this little bug that looks like scales on the cactus. It's actually a predator, a, 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 um, what do you call it? a pest of the mm. cactus. It, sap, it feeds from the sap of the cactus. And uh, it, you need 155,000 bugs to make one pound of dye. That means harvesting around uh, 50 leaves of cactus on both, um, yeah, like, on both sides so that's a lot of cochineal and cochineal in itself you know it's so interesting as a topic and there's books written about it yeah, and how like a whole other conversation yeah, there. this humble bug <laughs> changed the politics and economics of six, 16th century europe wow. it was being uh, traded for its weight in gold almost because um, red was such a scarce color in europe it was only reserved for the royals cardinals high-ranking military officers and here in this continent, which in in our tradition we call Sem Anahuac, the place surrounded by the big waters, that's in the language of uh, uh, the Mexicas, the Aztecs. So so yeah, we had plenty a plentiful source of red, and I'm so sure. So you were just saying that the Aztecs taxed your people. Yeah. And you were telling saying that. They only wanted things dyed in Cochino. Yes, yeah, that's that. That was the the taxation, you know, mm -hmm. or the tributes we had to pay. And what uh, happened when the Spaniards came then? Oh, then I mean, uh, they realized that Cochino was such a high commodity. They started exporting it to Europe, and you know, everybody. I mean, they kept it as a secret. No one knew where Cochino comes from. Came from. It's like mis mystic or something. Huh? Just it was very mysterious. Yeah, yeah, very mysterious. They didn't tell anyone. The Dutch were sending spies. The French too. <laughs> the English pirates were trying to raid the vessels, the ship wow. shipments of cochineal. So yeah, it's an incredible, you know. But yet yeah, it's it's another domesticated bug. It exists in the wild here. I've seen it in Southern California, mm -hmm. Texas. Uh, but the wild cochineal doesn't produce enough carminic acid to mm. make a, a, you know, a, a good color. You need four times as much wild cochineal to produce the same amount of dye. So just like corn, cochineal was domesticated and tended, and you know people build that relationship with with the cactus and the bug to create the cochineal that we now grow. Wow. I did not know that. What cactuses do it does it grow on in where you are? Yeah, I mean, uh, we call it um, just um, yapia in our language, mm -hmm. which is just nopal, nopal mm. de Castilla. Some people call it because it has very few thorns. I mean, compared to other cactuses, so it's easy to work with and uh, it's easy to propagate. And cochineal grows best on that type of cacti. So, um, you, your family has a farm, and you're telling me that you guys grow a bunch of all amazing foods, and yeah. and your whole—I mean, who lives on your farm? Like your whole family? <laughs> like you have? How yeah. does that work? How how is your your so, family's land? To give you an idea of how we live there, I mean, um, we live in a community which has existed there, you know, for probably the last 14,000 years. Wow. We've been in that piece of land since like then. Like your ancestors. Yeah, I mean, since the last little ice age when humans migrated to and crossed the Bering Strait and probably crossed these lands of California on their way south looking for green pastures and sunshine. So our myth of creation, you know, when our ancestors arrived to this peak in, in our village, their god came from the sky in the shape of a bird uh, with the seven Pleiades behind it. And, you know, people heard voices, thunder from the skies, and the god uh, gave them all the land that they could see from the top of that mountain. But those, that land was given to the community as a whole. 
So no, in our tradition, there is no, we don't have a sense of private ownership of the land. It's only recently that the government, you know, is forcing us to have these documents with the signatures. That, like how know, recently? I mean, I, it started since the Mexican Revolution, but okay. it hasn't even taken, like, as, as of now, we don't have documents that can, you know, prove this is really? your piece of land. But, you know, we've lived there and we have our houses there. Uh, one thing that uh, we do, there is a committee, uh, it's called Comisariado. I mean, it, it functions on both sides, on the federal, it's recognized by the federal laws and... And uh, it's also, they have the authority uh, emanating from the community. Mm, these people are elected every three years to do voluntary work for the community and they're in charge of managing all the land hold aspects. But whenever you get married and if you start a new family, if your family doesn't have enough land to, to give you, to pass on to you, you could just you know, talk to this comedy and during the town meeting uh, you could ask for a piece of land to build your own house oh. and to grow your own food. So it's like a birthright, you know, it's oh. like, I mean, I think of it as a basic human right. I Sometimes, you know, I think it's, I don't know if it's part of uh, the UN, I think so, access to water, land and all that. But if you think about it, like in this modern world where people are living luxurious lives in the city and you're like, but they're working so hard, they're struggling so hard to beg, to meet that basic need, you know, to buy a piece of land. I know it's harder in some places like San Francisco or Seattle or Austin, mm -hmm. but you know, that privilege, you know, to be able to make that connection with the land, with the animals that thrive in there and, uh, you know, all the benefits, the health, mental and social benefits that you get when you have that connection. It's something that I've seen lost in this modern day way of life. So, yeah, I think it's something to think about. And uh, like today we were having that conversation at the, at one of the, um, uh, workshops and yeah uh, I think I was asking you know what what is the proportion of land that's the public lands that there is in the US now and I think it's just shrinking they it's yeah. shrinking and shrinking especially so, with Trump being president right now <laughs> so yeah I mean it is it is a hard hard situation and uh, it's just hard to manage all all these like broken pieces of private land to be able to have wildlife corridors to be able to have a, a more holistic way of managing a forest we're talking about using fire in a way more in a preventive way than in a you know put down all the fires kind of thing mm -hmm. i mean the, the, that's on our topic of conversation but I know we were talking about that on the way here the yeah. fire and looking at the land as we were driving here and yeah. seeing where there had been fire that went out of control and yes. where fire would how it would be good and you were telling me about a fire that you had yeah. at home and yeah it's like and, and thing. the thing is like I mean because we live in a community they just rang the bells and everybody started to show up there to see what, what was needed and spontaneously you know in a couple of hours, you had uh, like 200, 400, 500 people. It grew big, like the whole wow. town was involved. We needed zero resources from the federal or state government, you know, uh, and we just went there and controlled the fire in a traditional way and, you know, made sure it stayed sort of under control, you know. I know fires are hard to manage, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, it was put down, controlled, and they are healthy for the ecosystem, and yeah, but everybody was involved, everybody, you know, was part of it. We as young people were learning how to, how to handle those situations, the elders were there guiding, and the local committee was coordinating all that. And it's just amazing to see the power of community, it's just amazing to be part of that. Yeah, it's very fascinating just seeing, hearing you talk about your, the town and how everyone works together and yeah, yeah, and, and it's not all petals and roses, <laughs> yeah. you know, like 
there's like 8,500 people living there and there's friction, there is disagreements, there's different opinions, but it's, I mean, in which human gathering yeah. you don't find that, you know? Yeah. I'm always very curious about um, how the effect of tourism has on local communities because that was like, yeah. when I was in college, that was my biggest research actually. Because yes. I went to South America and I was like, wow what would it be like if we didn't come here for these people yeah. like in the way that they are now engaging with their traditional crafts yeah. are now that these people mm-hmm. are coming and wanting to have some yeah. like relationship with it and you were telling me on the drive that in some ways you think it's really awesome that people yeah. are interested in your uh like the weaving traditions that your people have but yeah. also it's complicated too you're like oh sometimes i wish maybe i'd like to do something else or like yeah. <laughs> it it does seem like, um, yeah, you were saying that that started more when the highway was put in. Yeah. And so can you talk more about how yeah. you feel like tourism has mm-hmm. been good and bad for Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, it's always like that. It's, uh, it's never just black and white. There is the gray and there's all these layers of complexity. But um, <clears throat> on my personal experience, you know, from the way I see things... Uh, we as a sub, like the Zapotec people have always been open I mean when the Spanish arrived and they were on their way to go and destroy the uh, Mexicas the Tenochtitlan the city of Tenochtitlan I mean and there's many reasons for that but I'm just trying to say that we, we just were welcoming to these people and we f- gave them our food and later on we took on their wool and they 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 actually you know brought the the current looms that we use which mm. is a 16th century loom style mm. of loom an european style of loom but you know it's the same type of loom that we've been using for the last almost 500 years and we embraced that we embraced that change we embraced those you know different faces and their ways and the same when the they opened the highway you know we, we we're always just people you know we want to connect and to build new relationships so i think on a personal level i've been in this world of crafts uh when i went to the markets in oaxaca city for the first time i remember just being truly amazed to have the opportunity to meet people from all over the world coming to visit oaxaca Back in the days, they wouldn't even go as far as visiting our village. It only took a few really courageous backpackers, adventurers <laughs> who were like, yeah, no, I want to see your village. Most people were just, you know, on big bus tours and they were being, sh- you know, shepherded around. <laughs> but uh, I think thanks to, to our craft and to that openness to the world, we have been able to just... Uh, being known for that and be, you know, uh, we have traded or rugs. So in a way, I think that saved our forests hmm. because the towns next door probably didn't have as many crafts or or the types of crafts. I don't know. Sometimes we're just lucky because we're close to the capital, to the mm-hmm. city, to Oaxaca City. So it's easy to trade. Yeah. Your crafts. So you know, tourism find our way and then we were selling our crafts so we didn't need to log our forests to make income we need we didn't need to hunt or to look for exotic species to trade for cash for for good money so we still preserve a lot of the ancient pristine you know pine and oak forest and some pine forest at the very top of our common lands so it's interesting, you know, I think uh, that's something that we truly appreciate it. and uh, we're always so thankful for that gift, the gift of weaving that came from our ancestors and and that's why people are so, you know, uh, protective and and careful with it and then, you like know. Like you were saying about sharing it yeah. and how people easily exploit, yes. exploit it because yeah. it could be hip or whatever. Yeah. But you know, also, I've realized that uh, in this world, this current world of, you know, open source, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, 
um, more like I think the more we integrate it's the better we just have to be responsible in the way mm. we create this you know relationships and that's the a way good way to it. think about it integrate responsibly yeah. because there seems to be a duality sometimes around that like yeah you know does integration mean diffusion yeah. of cultural identity yeah because for how long can you can you hide a secret you know yeah the after the mexican independence you know the spanish lose the monopoly on cochineal the chinese lose the lose the monopoly on the silk so you know and uh, in this world that i see you know I would rather have more people weaving their own clothes, weaving, you know, blankets, than seeing more rugs made from, you know, petroleum or made in sweatshops or being sold for really cheap with our patterns by IKEA, which I've seen. So I'm oh, like, really? yeah, 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 I've seen them. And I'm like, that's, that's just not fair. And, uh, there's more work that we need to do in that regard. I know some Guatemalan organizations, also in Oaxaca, we had a recent case of a designer literally taking a traditional outfit, a traditional shirt from um, the Mije people and put it as it is on a, I think it was a, a collection of clothing like a supermodel yeah like a supermodel it was it was all over social media and uh, people were outraged and did they win in some yeah way i think kind of... they managed to have her pull it back of her collection do you remember the name of the designer oh like? god i don't i don't okay. so, just curious yeah but it's a french designer and uh yeah it was i mean now is the time like you know with with all these tools these new tools I'm always thinking about that when with art and how, yeah, you can be influenced by someone and yeah. and, and the colors maybe someone uses you use in your art, but yeah. maybe it's different totally, you know. Yeah. And like, where does that fine line suddenly between what's copying, what's yes, what's inspirational, and what's just what's, inspirational? Yeah, and I mean, I I say you know I have nothing against you know you taking our symbols and patterns and replicating them for personal use for you know giving us a gift for sharing. But it's another thing to make commercial exploitation of that because it's just not equal, you know. Mm -hmm. I cannot explode a patent from the Western world for, you know, for medicine, for technology, let alone for, you know, a logo for Nike or for whatever, for another brand. You know, if I start doing commercial exploitation of that, I'll get hundreds of lawyers mm -hmm. on my, yeah, on my, you know, chasing me, so... And for all those, you know, common, I don't know how they call it, like common, like knowledge and patterns and design that, you know, belongs to everyone, but knowing at the same time. But, you know, there is, there is some lines of heritage and there's some kind of, you know, like, I don't mind if like the next town or another Zapotec, because there's many Zapotec regions, if another Zapotec region uses it so you know it's does each town kind of have their own style yeah. or each area yeah generally? i mean the, also the thing is uh like uh as indigenous people from this continent we share the same we call it uh philosophical and cultural womb even though we we have different ways of telling the story we have this uh, common root, this common ancestry. And so a lot of the patterns and symbols too, that's that's also another fine line. It's shared, you know, with uh, the Incas, it's shared here with the with the people from this land, from Turtle Island, from the Navajos, the Hopis. And, you know, even further away, I've seen them, you know, I've seen like the rugs in India and Nepal and in other parts of the world share, you know, very kind of similar, but they have their own way. Way. Yeah, I mean, I, there is a difference, but there is some common ground to, to those patterns and symbols. So, you know, um, it's, it's tricky, you know, who, who owns this 10,000 year knowledge and who can make use of it. It's, it's a hard question. Yeah, but, uh, now with 
with technology allowing us to see each other's yeah. artwork just like that and yeah. traditions and in the past yeah we weren't we were so separated by geography and we didn't yes. you know or trading would happen so much slower and the yeah. ideas would morph so much slower and so strange times ran with all of that yeah sure. i'm i'm always curious as to you know how this shapes our traditional way of life because sometimes i feel like I have my foot on two worlds. Like right now, I'm here in the U.S., sharing, teaching this, and this getting is like on a an very airplane. Global place, you yeah, know? There's people from everywhere, all over the country, all over the world, and and yet, you know, I, I when I go when I fly back home, you know, we have our herd of twenty goats, some like uh, some of the original wild cows that the Spanish brought to this continent. Mm-hmm. We still tend and herd them, take care of them in the common lands. And they, they've been roaming their free range before even the word free range was a cool thing to say. They're all organic, <laughs> you know, eating grasses and plants as medicine. And uh, I love the things also, you know, that uh, that I see the need for, um, it's already there, we already have it, but yet we're like, you know, sometimes I think like, especially probably with the young generations where I'm from and in Mexico, we think like, oh, we want to, you know, live the American dream to see how how our communities could be more modern, more fashionable, more, more cool, more this and that. And yet here I'm finding like, well, what we have is already so cool. It's already what you have is what so it's many the people answers here that want. <laughs> yeah, it's the answers that the people here want. And I'm like, in a way, it's very, uh, it it comforts my heart, you know, to know mm-hmm. that it uh, it makes me appreciate my culture even more. And uh, it's just nice to hear it, you know. It's uh, I love the things I've been learning here, you know. Um, like all that wildlife tracking and flint napping and how to do friction fire uh the words that we use all that knowledge is encoded in our language like mm. i i didn't know that mule fat uh is that the plant is that what it's called mm-hmm. uh, to make friction fire with mm-hmm. the sticks we use the plant to dye to make a beautiful green light green mm. it's used as a medicinal um plant in the temascal which is like our traditional sauna or sweat lodge but i didn't know it was used for you know to make friction fire and the word for that plant in our language is yashi mm-hmm. yach yach is plant Sh denotes possession and then you have the ending gi gi yashi a uh, gi is fire, so a literal translation Whoa. is the plant for fire. Whoa. But the, I, you know, honestly, <laughs> until I came here, I never saw that connection. Are you gonna go try and do it when you get home? Oh, I already did. I, I cut some. It's drying. It's, it's there. And uh, yeah, as soon as I get there, I'm gonna start making fire and teaching people. You know. So maybe that was used there at one point for of that. Of course, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, and it, and it took me. A journey here to rediscover that so that's the beauty in this you know in this connected world you guys are rediscovering some knowledge that we have forgotten we have kept some of the weaving knowledge that the Europeans brought you know of course we had our weaving tradition but it was all influenced mm-hmm. and I love when I hear stories of people learning how to weave with us and be like oh my grandma had a loom and it's mm-hmm. just sitting there and now I can warp it and reuse it and start using it mm-hmm. so that's just closing the loop you know how we all have a part of the answer for this complicated puzzle and it takes people coming together to you know figure out and shape the way we want the future to look like what has it been like for you with all of the cross-cultural dialogue and like these yes. conversations that have been happening this week? I know you've been yeah. attending all of them and offering your perspective and just yeah, the these the Earth Skills. Yes. I mean, I don't even know what we're gonna what's gonna be called anymore. I after, know. <laughs> you know, it's like all transforming and it's great. It needs to happen, but yeah, you know, 
just addressing things that have been um, not being addressed. And yeah. Yeah, I'm curious what you think of all that that's been happening here at Buckeye. I know. I mean, and uh, like I said in the gathering, uh, in the like community dialogue. You what? stayed up. Did you stay up till 3 a.m.? Yeah. Night? I yeah. mean, we stayed pretty late. I don't remember. Like, it was like 1 or 2, and we kind of just worked it out and talked, and uh, we finished singing and just mm-hmm. having just a really beautiful conversation from one human being to another with all of our different you know ancestral lineages there and um you know that's the one thing i i said you know we we might possess these ten thousand year old skills but we haven't learned how to live with each other with all these different ancestral lineages coming together and um and you know it happened in our in your region like uh when everybody was fighting against the Aztecs under the the flag of the Spanish conquistadores and there was already tension built there and uh and if you look around the world there's always you know some tension built and uh just the story of colonization and it's it's powerful you know it's it's something that um you know, when we talk about it, it uh, we're carrying all these emotions. If we think about it, it triggers some people, and they are powerful, hard conversations to hold. Mm-hmm. But they need to be held, and uh, and this is a space, you know, that allowed that to happen. And uh, it was a very intense moment. It was uncomfortable for some people, but you know, it takes that maturity, that you know roundness to be able to see the pain in each other and the pain in ourselves and talk about it and heal heal together Mm -hmm. and I think that's the only way forward like we should heal together and and stand you know shoulder to shoulder yeah I stayed until 11 30 I think and then I heard that it got more deep and intense and sometimes uh, yeah just intense and good in bad ways, I yeah. guess. <laughs> After no. that, late into the night, and yeah. as the, as the crowd got smaller and yeah, yeah, I'm I'm glad it happened, and I'm curious yeah. how it could happen differently. But I'm you know. no, but I mean, I think the way they said it, it was like, and it's okay that it happened like this, mm-hmm. you know, because this is what it is, and it needed to happen, you know. And like this is that some people had pulled out some other trauma and was talking about it and it was like really hard like yeah i mean some people started to use you know stronger language and you know it it was um there was some element of youth and mm-hmm. and you know i don't know the story of everybody you know what what you're carrying with you into this but uh but it it was just really uh, great to have, you know. It's mm-hmm. it's there, you know. It, we shouldn't just turn our eyes no uh, away from it and try to hide it or try to control it. I mean, as long as we we keep our hearts there, uh, it's possible, you know, to find healing, to find forgiveness, to find common ground to find connection it's i think you know at the end of the day we, we we humans are motivated by the same things we need the same things you know no matter what our background is no matter what cultural background we have or what we've been through personally and uh, that's the deeper learning you know that we're taking here mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's these ancestral skills that are common across all the tribes around the world you know it's it's pulling back all that knowledge all 10,000 year knowledge or maybe 14,000 or all of that you know so it's it's a great way of connecting it's a powerful way and you know it's it's not gonna be easy for sure yeah I mean with the gatherings and we talked about this on the way here it's just complicated 
in the context of the United States and and this and the colonization history here and how certain people have been punished for practicing their ancestral skills. You yes. know, and you're where you're from. I don't know what that dynamic has been yeah. like, but you've been able you've been keeping your weaving tradition in some form, you know, and yeah. a lot of people a lot of native peoples in the Yeah. In the United States and beyond have been Yes. I mean they were forced into schools where they couldn't speak yeah. their language or they yeah, couldn't um, live in their on their tribal lands and yeah. they couldn't practice their their traditional ways and now they're trying you know a lot of people want to try to find yeah. that again and some people don't want to and like but and but then yeah. all these mostly white people are trying yeah. to figure out how to connect and like sometimes that may be appropriate sometimes it yeah. might not be and so it's like really it's but complicated. you know i think somebody said you know like uh something that really caught my ears my attention was that you know he or she was like um you know, just saw himself uh, suppressing his kid's wilderness, you know. He was like, I see the witch hunt in me, you know. Hmm. Because it's all been suppressed, you know, in all cultures. Like, yes. there is, I don't know what happened. I don't know where there is a missing link. I don't know if, I don't know, you know. I can't think of a few things, but I don't want to <laughs> point out too directly to that, but... But yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's some forces out there that want to suppress this, you know, primordial need. Of yeah, the earth and goddess, yes. feminine, wild, yeah. feral energy. Yes, you know? yeah. Like, so, what is that happening in our bigger world? You yeah. Know? So you know, I I see that we we are we're all suffering and we all need it. You know, people that have made lots of money and probably have patents or you know, best-selling books or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, end of the day, we're looking for that thing, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, the joy you get when you make fire from scratch mm -hmm. or a piece of <laughs> weaving, you know, from the natural materials that you could gather from, you know, your farm, from around where you live, from the plants, the insects, putting all this together because it took... I often say, I say, our rocks they have taken 10,000 years of research and development, you know, <laughs> from domesticating the cochineal and even figuring out the corn to feed ourselves. But, you know, when you do that, you know, you get a tremendous sense of satisfaction. To be of, a part of all the process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah to, to, to learn all these ancestral skills, you get a sense of fulfillment, you know, mm -hmm. that you could thrive and live on this planet with you know what nature provides you know so I think uh, it's a great for me it's so inspiring I think I'm already thinking oh, I should go back to Oaxaca and get all the other towns all the pottery makers and everyone else to come like this and gather and share and and build more connection because mm -hmm. you know we also live Sometimes, like, a bit separate and buried in our worlds. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a weaver, and I only know how to weave, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I might be a really good weaver, but... Well, now you know how to make friction fire. Right? Yeah, and <laughs> to fling nap and to shoot arrows. Oh, yeah, you did that today. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the cool thing. There's so many things. And there's nothing wrong, you know, with specialization, because the way... Uh, our ancestors worked it out, you know, different villages specialized in different things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you were just born into something and it's just, it's just part of you. Like, I learned how to weave for sure before I learned how to ride a bicycle. Really? So that's, that's kind of cool, you know, if, yeah. if you're just born into just making amazing pottery and then, Does and then you could expand. Your whole family weave? Oh yes, like, like I mean everyone. the whole village. I, some some families claim like oh we're the, no it's it's a common heritage like we all inherited this from our ancestors and mm -hmm. everybody in Teotitlan has a loom even you know if you're a carp uh, if you're a electrician or a plumber wow. some people have little shops and you know when they're just waiting for customers they'll be weaving rugs. Mm -hmm. um, Do you feel like the young younger people are also just as in 
doing yes. the weaving. Like it's still, it's not like, yeah, what is that looking like? Because I, that was kind of like where I wanted to yes. close, close this. Out. And yeah. also like, what do you see as the future with the younger people there? You know, yes. did mention that some people are looking and seeing maybe how they could modernize and some yeah. people are don't want to do that and yeah what does weaving look like in your town i think uh yeah i think our i think our ancestors or grandfathers grandmothers got this concept right from the beginning now they call it el buen vivir to use to um you know figure out a way in which you could live in this planet and have the things that really you know matter to you to have those real needs satisfied so actually because we've made you know a decent income from our weavings mm -hmm. you know not everyone there is you know terribly well off just from selling mm -hmm. weavings some people are but most of us are just you know working hard and making meeting making ends meet but you know weaving allows us that so so a lot of people haven't bought into this, you know, supposed dreams of modernity and industry. Mm -hmm. And some people, of course, have moved into the city because they wanted to and they were, you know, probably pushed into that. But but a lot of people still weave, you know. It's, uh, it's still a big part of our way of life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of young people are getting educated I don't know if we have, like, I was the first one in the family to get a degree. What's your degree in? Uh, I got, I studied, ah, funnily enough, uh, my, um, industrial engineering. Wow, really? Yeah, just coming from this, you know, making stuff background, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, industrial engineering sounds You have an industrial that's cool. engineering degree. Yeah, <laughs> and then I got a scholarship to do a PhD on sustainable manufacturing. You have a PhD? Yeah, I do. Really? <laughs> because just as I was finishing my industrial engineering degree, I actually came to California, and I... Um, I, I met a bunch of cool people in Berkeley and I was pulled into that, you know, those conversations and I ended up, you know, uh, listening to a lot of progressive talk about climate change and sustainability and, and then I felt the call. I was like, okay, all this industrial engineering degree is probably not what we need, you know, mm -hmm. statistics and quality control to make products that poison ourselves, mm -hmm. that are damaging the earth, that are not easily recyclable, that use fossil fuels, that cannot be disassembled and recycled yeah. easily. So I thought, you know, I felt the call to do, to pursue a further degree and to do research in this field. So I went to England, I studied in the University of Liverpool and, you know, four years of just doing research a lot of the things you know I find out we already knew this all this sustainability right, it's like, come right back around it's the, the same, same thing we've been doing for <laughs> 10,000 years but the key question is how to transform our production and consumption system right. into something that is rooted you know in the traditional way in the ancestral skills but yet that can meet you know the needs of 7.2 billion people on this planet yeah. I mean it's people just work themselves to death just to afford to eat and yeah. have a, pl a place to sleep you know yeah. and they feel like they don't have time to make things slow in yes. a slow way and, and yeah. notice that here like outside of here there's always this thought of oh you need to figure out how to have good time management and yeah. schedule, schedule every hour and every moment and every minute of your day and it's like you can't think that way when you're weaving or carving something or, yeah. you know, like with the, the pottery I did this week, just, it just, if you rush it, then it'll crack. The pot will crack. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it it's like totally opposite of what I feel like is natural for us yeah. as human beings, you know, like way of thinking about time and how we interact with the things that are around us. And yes. Yeah. I didn't know you had a PhD. I know. <laughs> so I, you're I a never. Doctor. I never put that out there. I'm Dr. just like, Samuel. Ah, yeah. One time I <laughs> sat down for four years in front of a desk, read a bunch oh of God. papers, and wrote seventy thousand words about it. <laughs> wow. So yeah, uh, you know, 
in my village, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> fine, good enough. <laughs> um, Where but, was uh, your undergrad? In Oaxaca. I studied okay, in there, Oaxaca. Okay, there, and then you did PhD in Liverpool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, we're, we've, we're at like 50 <laughs> minutes, so I think that's yeah, pretty good. I know. I could talk to you forever I could all talk this. about this forever, too, and there's <laughs> so much to be said, so many ideas, and... Yeah, and I also... Yeah, come on ground. Yeah, another time ask you about yes. plants and I know. stuff that you, we've talked about that you have there and that you use on your farm and... Yeah. But maybe that'll be another. Yeah, that'll be another time. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm I'm so honored to you know. Yeah, I'm glad we finally got to sit, sit down here in this busy and chat. Gathering I know. And talk. It was awesome. <laughs> Give you some information. Yeah, yeah. Your, I'll put all my info. You know, my yeah. People can maybe visit your family's land. Yes. And you have yeah. An Instagram handle. I what know. is that? You can go ahead and it's see. a at Dixa D I X Z A Rugs and Dixa Rugs Organic Farm. That's how you can find us on Instagram, and uh, we have a little website there. It's half done. It's Dixa, D I X Z A, Rugs Organic Farm dot com. Cool. So and you yeah, have like an Airbnb at your place too, and you yes, can come and, yeah. If and you want us, yeah, if you want to visit, stay with us. You know, we have three rooms on Airbnb that now is bringing all those adventurers and those people seeking connection. Mm -hmm. You can stay with our family, you know, learn how to weave, work in our farm, help us in the kitchen, oh, learn cool. cooking. We'll show you around. We organize horseback riding tours and we mm -hmm. take you to the Temascal sessions with the healer. And we're just trying to, you know, give people a, a true sense of what it's like to live in that little place of land that we have. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks okay. for sitting down with and me. And maybe see you in Oaxaca <laughs> I sometime. I, I want to go now. I've been, someone, yeah, someone planted that seed in my head a while ago and then meeting you and I'm like, yeah. okay, now we're really, I gotta go. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Oh, thank Seems you like so you much. Seems like you met a lot of people here too that are also like, we're coming to visit you, Samuel. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, it's dark here. We've been hearing geese uh, and frogs and, um, yeah, it's cold, Crickets. and I think we both want to go get sweaters and stuff. Yes. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for okay. letting me interview you, and it was wonderful meeting you. Okay. Until next time. Yeah. Asa. <laughs> you just listened to episode one of the Ground Shots podcast, and I'm so excited that we've got this audio project finally out there. Yeah, after doing this interview and listening to this interview a few times I just really am like I'm so happy I'm doing this and um I want to keep doing it so I hope you listen to the other episodes that we'll be releasing soon and um who knows maybe I'll do a part two with Samuel at some point I really feel like I want to go visit where he lives and the land that he inhabits and his family inhabits and his community inhabits uh, after learning so much from him about what it's like there and um, how they work with the land. So I hope you feel inspired too. You know, I started this audio project because I felt like I wanted to do work in the world that forms bridges in some way. And um, between people and the way that they relate to each other in the land that they inhabit or experience and um, work with. Because we all experience this earth in some way because this earth is why we're even here in the begin with. And um, I feel like bridges are important. And I have been doing things like that through my art and writing. But I feel like something about the intimacy of audio. Yeah, it's just a different way. It's another lens to look through or to experience or to spark something within all of us um, to feel something or to think about something in a little bit of a different way. And um, I definitely welcome feedback anytime. So if you have it, please do email me. Yeah, that's my interview with Samuel. Thank you. This episode of the Ground Shots podcast was produced by Opia Creative. Our music is by Mother Marrow. If you'd like to help us continue to make this audio project a reality, 
consider becoming a monthly supporter on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash obsessionsalt, where we have rewards like entry into patron-only giveaways, additional audio interviews, extra educational content, and much more. You can also share our work and give us a review on iTunes. Visit our website at obsessionsalt.com to see what else we're up to and a log of our episodes when they come out. Check out our show notes for information about how to find us and our guests. Until next time, y'all. Thanks for listening.